Bonjour et bienvenue to our Zoom series of lectures about Les Grands Châteaux de la Loire and Ile de France. My name is Mary Ellen Canellen and I am the executive director here at the Alliance Française du Chicago. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Château de Fontainebleau in the company of our special guest, Oriane Beaufils, curator at the Château, and this series curator, Russell Kelly. But before we get started, I have a few tips for those of you who might be new to Zoom. You've been muted and will remain muted to avoid sound interference during the talk. We encourage you, however, to communicate with us at any time using the chat line. To find the chat line, go to the bottom of your screen and the little icon is right there in the middle. Give it a try and let us know where you're listening from. Please know that you can also mute or stop your video camera should you want more privacy during the talk. We encourage you to type your questions in the chat line at any time. They will be answered by our guest speaker at the end of her talk. Now this series would not have been possible without our lead partner, the Alliance Francaise Miami Metro. We would also like to thank members of our Alliance Network in the US, those from the French Heritage Society, as well as participants joining us from Weiss in Paris. And finally, a few words about our esteemed series curator, Russell. He is a board member of the Alliance Francaise Miami Metro. He is a curator and moderator of this lecture series, Les Grands Châteaux of the Loire and Ile de France. And he is the author of The Making of Paris, the story of how Paris evolved from a fishing village into the world's most beautiful city. It will be published by Globe Pico Press next month, March 2021. He's lived in France for nearly 30 years and has visited every chateau featured in this series many times since his first visit to the Loire Valley 50 years ago. So without further delay, à vous, Russell. Merci, Mary Ellen. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome today's guest speaker, Oriane Beaufils, as you said, the, who has been curator of the Chateau de Fontainebleau for the past five years. Um, the first four lectures in this series dealt with the Royal Chateau in the Loire Valley that were all directly with, uh, directly or indirectly associated with the great Renaissance king and builder François Premier, Francis I. Today, we shift our focus from the Loire Valley to the region around Paris known as the Ile de France, the island of France, because it is virtually surrounded by rivers. And we will also continue with our hero, François Premier, uh, who upon his release from captivity in Madrid, as Ariane will explain, to us uh, resolved to move the court from the Loire Valley back to Paris. It had originally been in Paris and it was moved to the Loire Valley in the Hundred Years War and Francois Premier brought it back to Paris. And he was a builder. He built two new chateaux, entirely new chateaux in Paris, the Chateau de la Madrid after the place where he had been imprisoned, uh, named after the place where he had been imprisoned for one year and the Chateau de la Mouette, both of them on the west side of Paris, neither of which exists today. He built the first Renaissance wing of the Louvre Palace, which we will hear about uh, later in the series. He also rebuilt the Chateau Saint-Germain-en-Laye uh, to the west of Paris, but by far the largest of his building projects was the reconstruction and expansion of the Chateau de Fontainebleau 43 miles south of Paris. In his memoirs, Napoleon I described Fontainebleau as the true abode of kings, a palace of the ages. In her presentation, Oriane Bofis will explain why. But first, she invites us to watch a two minute video to introduce the magnificent Chateau de Fontainebleau.
Avu Orian. Okay. So should I just? So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Fontainebleau, even in front of your computers. So I'm Oriane Dauphis. I'm curator at Fontainebleau. Uh, yes, I'm curator at Fontainebleau, and I'm going to present you the magnificent history of this jewel of French uh, heritage. Uh, and I hope you're going to enjoy it, but of course you will. Uh, so let me first uh, start by telling you that uh, we always hear about Fontainebleau that it's the home of 34 kings and two emperors, which is true, but some of them have marked a little bit more than the others, the history of Fontainebleau. So you will hear a lot today about Francis I. I heard you, Russell, saying it's our hero. It's most of all my hero. Uh, but he's really the hero of Fontainebleau because he recreated the chateau and he's the, the, the great renovator of Fontainebleau. He restarted uh, a path that was followed by all the kings uh, after, after him. After Francis I, you will hear a lot about Henry IV, uh, who was the first Bourbon king, but uh, he was educated, born and almost born and bred in the Valois Court. So he was also walking in the path of uh, Francis I and he also renovated and constructed even more uh, in Fontainebleau. Then you will hear about Louis XIV and his passion for dancing in the gardens of Fontainebleau. Louis XV, who went hunting in the, in the forest, in the magnificent forest around Fontainebleau. Napoleon I, well, I won't talk that much about that guy, uh, though we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of his death this year. Uh, you will hear then about uh, Napoleon III and his wife, Empress Eugenia, who were the last to build new spaces in the Chateau de Fontainebleau. But first of all, Fontainebleau was mentioned for the first time in 1137, so a long time ago, uh, in a royal charter of King Louis VII, uh, Louis uh, the Younger, as we call uh, him. We can only really surmise of what actually existed at that time in Fontainebleau, but it makes us one of the oldest castle in France, so it's worth, uh, it's worth saying. And uh, we have also this, this very important sentence by Jacques Androuet du Cerceau, who said, Tout ce que le roi pouvait recouvrir de, recouvrir de plus excellent, c'était pour son Fontainebleau. Basically, all that the king could have, the best thing that the king could have, he would send it to Fontainebleau. It was for Fontainebleau, because yes, it was kind of a favorite place for most, most kings, of, uh, kings of France. So, the beginning of the story is 1528. So, Francis I uh, has been in captivity in Madrid after the dreadful um, uh, loss of Pavia. He was, uh, he was imprisoned by Charles, uh, Charles V, Charles V. And after that, after his liberation, uh, he um, decided to uh, settle much more in the Ile de France. So it's the big moment for the renovation of the Louvre, for the renovation of Fontainebleau, of course, of saint germain laye for all the castles that are more close to Paris, to the capital, than uh, the, the places in the Loire Valley where he uh, was before, uh, Chambord, Blois, etc., etc. So the grand, pro the grand project for Fontainebleau begins in 1528 with the first uh, de vie, the first project to um, reuse this old castle and to use the material that were there to build a more convenient residence for Francis I and his court. We usually say that uh, he chose Fontainebleau because it was a hunting lodge, because there was the, the, the pleasure of the forest nearby, which is probably, probably true, but not only. Uh, he also wanted a place that was big enough to uh, have grand projects and big enough to be even more extended and the, the places available was, uh, was important. So he had to put some religious people away from Fontainebleau by giving a bit of money, which is not very difficult. He had to, to put some other um, um, people that were appropriate, that, were, um, that, uh, that, were, that had households in the, in the neighborhood away too, to have a big, big, big estate. So what you see on this slide is on the left, the Porte de Ré, the Golden Gate, so the main entrance of Fontainebleau during the Renaissance. It was built on the remnants of the medieval Châtelet, the Châtelet d'Entrée, uh, and it was decorated by Primaticcio, and it was a very, very important entrance. And on the right is the first, well, postcard of Fontainebleau, if I may say. Uh, it's painted by Rosso Fiorentino in the gallery of Francis I. We will talk about this gallery in a few minutes. And you can see there the Porte Dorée, the Golden Gate. Well, it's a bit, it's a bit different uh, for, from what you can see on the, on the slide, on the, on the real life, because it's a painting. But then you can still imagine 
that it was very, very important for as an entrance for the castle. So it's represented even in the uh, chateau. So let's do a little tour of the, of the important places uh, in the chateau. What do you need to have when you're a king? Of course, you have a bedroom. So it's here, the Chambre du Roi. He, uh, he was first married to Claude de France, but she died. And he married Eleonore de Triche, Eleonora of Austria, the sister of Charles Quint. So you need to have a bedroom for the queen too. It's the Chambre de la Reine. But when you're Francis I and you're so tall and so glamorous, you also need to have a beautiful mistress. And he had one, the Duchesse de Saint, who we hear about this extremely uh, beautiful lady, Anne de Pisleux. So her apartment was also closed from the Chambre du Roi. The Port Doré is here, and of course, of course, you need a place to have parties, and the Salle de Bal is just here. So you are in the Oval Court, and you have all the necessary things to um, have a good time when you're in Fontainebleau. Well, the masterpiece of the reign of Francis I is, of course, the Gallery of Francis I, La Galerie François Ier, which was called the Great, Great Gallery, La Grande Galerie, until Francis I built an even bigger gallery, which was the Odysseus Gallery, which was destroyed under the reign of Louis XV. And this Gallery of Francis I is really the masterpiece, the grand of, of, um, of the king. So let's enter this beautiful uh, gallery François Ier. The gallery François Ier, it's, it's kind of, um, it's the rêve d'Italie, the Italian dream of Francis I made true here in Fontainebleau. He wanted to have the best artists in his court, the best Italian artists. Of course, he had Leonardo da Vinci, but he never came to Fontainebleau. He died uh, 10 years before Francis I uh, came back to Fontainebleau. He wanted to have Michelangelo. Michelangelo never came to Fontainebleau, though Francis I managed to get a sculpture from Michelangelo. He managed, though, to have Rosso Fiorentino. Rosso Fiorentino, who was long described by Vasari as a painter who was a bit bizarre, but kind of a great genius. And he was the genius at the court of Francis I. Who was he, Rosso Fiorentino? He was a Florentine painter in the most Florent, it's the Florentinist of the Florentines. He was, um, I can say, um, educated by uh, Andrea del Sarto, um, Fra Bartolomeo, and also uh, the, the, in the late career of Filippino Lippi in this period of 1500 Florence, where lots of things were changing in Florence. And so he was uh, a spectator and also an, ex an actor of the beginning, the very the burgeoning Second Renaissance, the generation, um, the generation that will uh, that will. Uh, the, uh, that will rise after uh, the death of Leonardo da Vinci and Raffaello. But he was really uh, nourished by uh, all the, this genius of the Renaissance. And in 1530, he arrives in France and he arrives in Fontainebleau. And he will have a very strong relationship with Francis I. There will, they will really, really be kind of friends. We know that they will devise together about the plans of the gallery. It's a very important figure for Fontainebleau. And for Fontainebleau, he will imagine this absolutely spectacular gallery, which mixes painting, architecture, and sculpture. All is mingling in this remarkable and beautiful space. So you have um, uh, fresco paintings that is, um, that is uh, framed by stucco decoration upon a, a wood paneling uh, that was made by, oh, everything was made by Italian artists. So we have a few dates about all of that. I know we know that the stucco decoration began in 1535, then the fresco were done until 13, 1538, and then the paneling was done until, until 1539. And this date is very important, 1539, because a very important person came to Fontainebleau, a very, very special guest, not such a great friend at all times, but well, things were a bit pacified at that time. It's Charles V, Charles, Charles Quint, the emperor. He comes to Fontainebleau. So Francis I wants to show the best. He's really kind of showing off the power of France and the capacity of France of doing amazing chateau. So he's showing, uh, Francis I is showing Charles Quint, the amazing gallery Francis I for two hours. People were kind of worried of what was happening between those two uh, in, in the gallery. So in the gallery, you have this very beautiful decoration. Here you have Danae, Danae, uh, the, uh, the Danae, the, the really the, the the, the mythological figure of uh, abundance and uh, fertility. She was fecundated by Jupiter. And you have the preparatory drawing for the fresco in Fontainebleau in the Chateau de Chantilly, another crown jewel, if I may say. 
and you have these two co-decorations that are absolutely magnificent. And you can, you can see this, this, uh, this air of, uh, of Renaissance, of Florentine Renaissance in all the sculpture of the gallery of Francis I. Here on this figure, you can think of the beautiful St. George of Donatello uh, in, in Firenze. And uh, in all, all, the, all the gallery of Francis I is really imbued of this climate of the Florentine Renaissance. After the gallery of Francis I, many, many other places were decorated by uh, Rosso and Primaticcio in Fontainebleau. Here you have the, what remains of the Chambre de la Reine, the, the former bedroom of Eleanor of Austria, with this chimney piece with a kind of uh, extravagant uh, stucco decoration and the little painted medallion with Venus and Adonis. And on the right, you have the ceiling of the bedroom of uh, Henry II, a second bedroom that is built for Henry II in, um, in the chateau. But you also have very bizarre, strange um, uh, things in the Chateau de Fontainebleau. And for example, you have this grotto, la grotte des pins, the pine grotto, which is a little, a little grotto that is down the um, down the pavilion of the of the main uh, the main court, and you have this kind of uh, very strange figures of uh, of um, Atlant of um, of men that are that are kind of paralyzed in the stone. This is an idea that comes from Mantua, from Giulio Romano, and this little grotto uh, was um, was a place to have like fresh air in uh, in the gardens of Francis I because Francis I loved his gardens. He organized the chateau, and in the same time. He organized the gardens and we also had in Fontainebleau a Mediterranean garden. Well, when you see the weather today, you have doubts in how these Mediterranean trees could uh, just grow up in Fontainebleau, but still uh, we know we have like the, 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 the accounts with the, the pines coming from Gascogne and um, the little uh, fruits, the lemons, the oranges that came from south of France that were brought to Fontainebleau to have kind of a Jardin des Délices. You also have like a kind of uh, also a very strange and original uh, decor. Here you have the Egyptian gate. So it's a gate uh, that was open on the Pavillon des Armes. We don't really know actually to what space this gate was supposed to open at that time. Uh, but it's a very interesting um, piece of sculpture and architecture because you have these Egyptian figures that are opening the doors and that are closely related to the Egyptomania of the court of France in the 16th century. You would love in the court of France, you would love um, having costumes of sphinges and uh, Egyptian goddesses and uh, have Egyptian costumes, Egyptian uh, hieroglyph writ written on the, on the architecture or on the books. There is a kind of um, passion for Egypt in, uh, in the 16th century France. But Fontainebleau is also the birth of, um, of the notion of French collection. You really have in Fontainebleau kind of the, the tabernacle of what is the most beautiful art in France at the time being. It's in this little tabernacle of Fontainebleau. For example, here, you have some pieces of sculpture. You have the nature of Niccolo Tribollo, who was a, um, a disciple of Michelangelo, with this beautiful goddess of nature uh, and uh, all with the, the multi-breasted figure of nature with all of the footy on it. And you have on the right side, the beautiful sleeping Ariadna, that is taken from a mold of the antiques in the Vatican, a mold taken by Primaticcio, coming back to France with the mold by boat, and then doing the bronzes in Fontainebleau itself. In Fontainebleau, we had a place where we did bronze. We also have a place where we did tapestry, where we can kind of do it all in, um, in Fontainebleau. Then you have, of course, Benvenuto Cellini, the very tempestuous uh, Florentine um, goldsmith who came to Fontainebleau twice. He did two big trips in Fontainebleau. Well, he didn't get along very well with the with Francis I mistress. So he, well, it's never good when you don't get along with the mistress. But he devised this extremely beautiful figure of the nymph of Fontainebleau, la nymph de Fontainebleau, this feminine figure with the long legs and all the animals of, um, of the hunting mythology around her. You have the stag, you have the boars, you have the, the, the dogs. And she's reclining on a spring. You see water that is running um, under, under her body. So it's the, this importance of nature, water, and women in Fontainebleau. It's kind of a me too space, you see, Fontainebleau, where women have a lot of power. And in Fontainebleau, you also had amazing collections. 
uh, and painting collection. You have to remember that the best thing that are now in the Louvre used to be in Fontainebleau. Even the pyramid of the Louvre uh, was made, the glass was made with sand coming from Fontainebleau because it's the finest sand in the world, it's true. And the big collection of paintings of Francis I was in Fontainebleau in what was the bath apartment. So it was under the gallery of Francis I. You had kind of a um, Renaissance spa with seven rooms with uh, hot tubs, uh, cold tubs, a piece where you can have like barber activities. And on the walls were exposed the most beautiful paintings of the collection. So the Mona Lisa, um, the Saint Anne, um, the, all the famous Leonardo da Vinci. You also had all the paintings of Raphael uh, that were uh, in France at that time period of um, Andrea del Sarto. Uh, well, all, all the great paintings of the collection were in Fontainebleau. You also had fine piece of goldsmithing. Here you can see Benvenuto Cellini Saliera. So a little look at the bedroom of this Duchess of Etampes. I told you about the importance of women in this, uh, in this Chateau uh, de Fontainebleau. And here you can see her bedroom that was then transformed into uh, a staircase with this fresco showing the love stories of Alexander the Great, surrounded by um, two very, very beautiful, slender stucco figures of women that we are now uh, restoring and uh, studying during this uh, kind of semi uh, French uh, lockdown. Here you have Alexander giving a crown to beautiful Roxane. Uh, his official wife with putty that are just unveiling her. It's very beautiful. It comes from a drawing of Raphael. So here, the Duchesse du Temps. Then another little tour of this uh, cour, the cour, uh, the cour d'honneur du château, the, the big court today with the famous um, horseshoe uh, staircase. Here you have the Pavillon des Armes, where we think that the collection of armors of Henry II was. All the buildings of the court. Well, it, all the, these buildings were very transformed under the reign of Henry IV and then under the reign of Louis XV. But you still have this idea of kind of, um, of uh, very low, kind of low uh, buildings with central pavilions uh, and this uh, alternance of uh, uh, brick and oh, how do we say ardoise? Well, I will just say ardoise um, uh, that, that that makes an architecture with three colors. And then we have the Salle de Bal. The Salle de Bal is the other great moment of uh, the Ecole de Fontainebleau. It was designed by what, 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 what is the best in, France, uh, Renaissance, in French Renaissance. So the architect is Philibert Delorme, the Frenchiest of the Frenchies. He wanted to do architectural treaties just like the Italian did, like Alberti, uh, etc. Uh, and the decoration the, the, was done by Francesco Primaticcio for the drawings and then painted by Niccolo Dell'Abate, another Italian painter coming from Modena. So here you have some pictures of the ballroom, the spectacular coffered ceiling, the arcades with stories of um, Bacchus uh, having a kind of a drinking party, uh, Ceres uh, taking care of how the bread are made, Apollo playing the lira da braccio for the muses, the dances of the grace. Well, you have feasting, having fun, dancing, music. Well, it's it's kind of the of the of the place of the pleasure. Here you have some details of the very beautiful frescoes and the preparatory drawing. Here you have uh, the preparatory drawing for, for Ceres um, preparing about supervising the preparation of bread. Here you have, you see, the guys in the boulangerie that they are putting the bread in the oven and then you have people taking the bread to people in the party. So it's kind of the beginning of the party soon. And I have to tell you that um, the Chateau de Chantilly and the Chateau de Fontainebleau are throwing two exhibitions this spring and summer. One um, uh, about uh, the drawings of the School of Fontainebleau in Chantilly, in the Chateau de Chantilly, and the other one in Fontainebleau about the restoration of the ballroom. So be there. And then at the end of the of the 16th century, uh, you have the building of the, this new wing, the Charles Ninth wing that we call the fine chimney wing, l'aile de la belle cheminée. So it's a new entrance with a beautiful staircase, uh, a new um, place to welcome people and a new access to the king's apartment. It's also the moment where the antichambre, the antichamber, will make its apparition in the French organization of space in a royal chateau. So you have more, more uh, rooms to cross if you want to get to the king. And it's, it is gonna be, there's gonna be more and more places to cross when you want to meet, to, to meet the king. And it's something interesting in the organization of, uh, of chateau. 
Well, now we arrive at the end of the Valois story and we enter the reign of Henry IV. Henry IV, as you know, uh, he was Roi de Navarre and he was married to the daughter of Catherine de Medici and Henry II, Marguerite, la reine Margot. Every know, everyone knows about the reine Margot. So he was raised at the Valois court, but was the first Bourbon king. And Francis I, for Henry IV, was really a model. He wanted to do things like Francis I did. So he enlarged the chateau. He built new spaces in the chateau. Henry II or Henry III, they didn't build new spaces. They did kind of little things for the decoration, but Henry IV had much importance in ambitions for Fontainebleau. So here you have his portrait on the left. And on the right, you have his equestrian portrait that was in this great chimney wing. And he created the monumental chimney with these reliefs of the, the battles that were, that were fought and his, his figure of a king like an emperor on his, uh, on his uh, horse. So what were the new spaces decorated under the reign of Henry IV? Of course, uh, when you have a big chateau, you need to go to the mass because it's important and you need to have a chapel. Well, in Fontainebleau, we have two chapels because we are rich. And this chapel, the chapel, the Trinity Chapel, it was built, it, it existed before Francis I. It was transformed under the reign of Francis I and transformed under the reign of Henry II. But the final decoration that you can see, it's uh, is done under the reign of Henry IV. And this is what we call the second school of Fontainebleau. The first school of Fontainebleau is the work of Rosso and Primaticcio and all of these Italian chaps that came to Fontainebleau that created really a school. They teach, they taught um, their pupils that were, some of them were Italian, some of them were French, and they really created this style that is uh, Italian with a touch of Frenchness. I think that's how we can sum it up. The second school of Fontainebleau, it's the same thing, but you have the pupils, of this of these um, masters of the first school of Fontainebleau that were raised and that inherited from the drawings and from the traditions of the first school of Fontainebleau and with this purpose you have the influx of new guys coming from the north from Flanders and the painter of the second school of Fontainebleau Ambroise Dubois, Jean Doué, there were people coming from the north so you have a kind of a mix between the grand tradition of Renaissance uh, Italian Renaissance art uh, with this kind of um, of uh, synthetic synthetic way of composing figures and this um, naturalistic approach uh, from time to time of the Flemish painters. This is the second school of Fontainebleau. And after the second school of Fontainebleau in France, well, you enter classicism. So the Trinity Chapel is one of the most beautiful examples of that. You can still see that we are, you still have this kind of a, trompe l'oeil and, uh, and um, extremely spectacular uh, uh, views of people ascending and descending heavens. You have the stucco decoration. It's a bit more calm on the stucco though. Uh, and it's really the, 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 one of the great examples of the second school of Fontainebleau. Henry IV also rebuilt in the chateau and he decided to transform the cour oval. Well, we say oval court, but as my former director said, it's much more patatoid, it looks like a potato, uh, more than uh, a, a true oval uh, court. And the door that you can see in the background, the baptistery uh, door, it was made under the reign of Henry IV. Um, Henry IV also wanted to have an equestrian monument of him in this door, but it was never realized. But the, the, the funny and, uh, and also the, the, the beautiful thing is that this door is also made with remnants, with fragments of the door constructed by Primaticcio in the, uh, the late, uh, in the uh, mid uh, 16th century in the other course. So in Fontainebleau, uh, it's kind of ecological way of seeing things. You always reuse things. Uh, they, but there is also this, this phenomenon of spolia and you want to, to take what remains uh, from the past and to use it for the present and the future. And this baptistery door was uh, reused as a model for many, many um, uh, chateaux in Europe. And uh, for example, in the Chateau de Chantilly. The Fontaine Court also was uh, changed and transformed uh, under the reign of Henry IV. Here you see in the background the, uh, the gallery of Francis I, the great chimney wing on the, on the right, uh, and the uh, El de Poil uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the left, and the sculpture that is on the left. Another uh, example of uh, Second School of Fontainebleau decoration is the Cabinet of Théagène, the Cabinet Oval, uh, where you had this uh, very beautiful paintings by Ambroise Dubois, painter of the Second School of Fontainebleau, surrounded by stucco. But you can see that in the lower part of this decor, you have little 
flower bouquet, you have little um, little landscapes, a little golden uh, kind of a, uh, decoration with little flowers on it. This kind of a refinement, miniaturistic refinement, which comes really from uh, from the north. The Diana Gallery, well, now it's in the uh, late 19th century style uh, with the library that was installed here during the reign of Napoleon III, but it was the Galerie de la Reine, um, the, the Queen's Gallery under the reign of Henry IV, again decorated by Ambroise Dubois, not in fresco because people forgot how to do, forgot at that time how to do fresco properly, so they did a uh, mural painting on, on plaster, on a, on, a, on, a dry, on a dry mortar. Uh, and this Galerie de la Reine was decorated with the stories of Diana. Uh, so you can see all, always this figure, this feminine figure of nature, of hunt. It's very, very important in Fontainebleau. And under this Galerie de la Reine, you have the Stag Gallery. The name of the Stag Gallery is quite difficult. It's quite easy to understand because you can see all these heads of stags that are uh, on the walls, and the Stag Gallery is kind of um, of a tour du propriétaire for the King of France. You have all the chateaux of the, the royal estate that are represented on the walls. So you can see Chambord, you can see the Louvre, you can see Saint-Germain, you can see Madrid, you can see Compiègne, you can see all the chateaux that belong to the French crown that are represented on these big maps. You also have the forests, you have the rivers. So you can re really comprehend just in one gallery all the jewels of the French crown. So it's quite a magic place to visit. And in this gallery of Francis I, of, um, of the stacks, you can, you can see all the bronzes uh, that, are, that were done by Primaticcio and that were installed in this gallery. In the garden that is just, uh, that is just uh, next to this gallery, you have the Diana Fountain. Uh, with this sculpture of Diana with all the dogs. And look, these dogs are absolutely uh, magnificent. They are sculpted by Pierre Billard and uh, they are peeing in the fountain. And I, I really love this, um, this detail. In Fontainebleau, of course, it, uh, it's the place of the royal mistresses. There was the Duchesse de Temps, the royal mistress and the reign of Francis I, but there was the, the other great women of the early 17th century. This time it's Gabrielle Destré. And Gabrielle uh, Destré had her own apartment too in the uh, Chateau de Fontainebleau. It was in the Pavillon des Poiles and it was a very beautiful apartment just overlooking the pond and uh, with a little private access, we will see it on the map, a private access to uh, the garden that was built on the pond. Very lovely. So you have on the left a representation of Gabrielle Destré with uh, stags and putty and, um, and her hunting in the background. And on the right, you have our famous Dame au bain, uh, ladies in the bath. This is also one of the postcards of the, the representation of the School of Fontainebleau. And it's one of the most beautiful paintings in our collection. So it is supposed to be Gabrielle Destré and her sister, the Duchesse de Villar, but well, you never know. And here you can see the evolution of the castle under the reign of Henry IV. So that's exactly what I was telling you, that here was the apartment of Gabrielle Destré. And here you had little stairs and you can access this garden, this kind of an island built on the pond. So it was a very, very, very beautiful uh, garden with the first um, uh, parterre that were uh, did, uh, did at, at that time. And it was really on the pond. And when, the, when, we, when we did some... Um, some excavations, well, how I'm going to say excavation down the pond, like archaeological things that you do underwater. Um, uh, we saw the remnants of, uh, of the, the fortifications of this, uh, of this garden. So it's, it's very interesting. And then um, Henry IV also did in Fontainebleau a Grand Canal, you see, not only Versailles has a Grand Canal. Uh, so Henry IV um, created the Grand Canal and we know that on the Grand Canal, there were lots of uh, little boats uh, doing uh, kind of, uh, of a fight, naval battles on the, on the Grand Canal. Uh, so it was a, a, place, a place of pleasure. Water is very important in the culture of Fontainebleau. And then we pass down to Louis XIV, uh, who was the great builder of the horseshoe staircase, which is a bit of our star here in Fontainebleau. It was built in the, in the 1630s, between 1632 and 1634. Uh, well, there was a horseshoe staircase before, but it was really transformed and 
um, be made bigger under the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, and then we skip to Louis the Fourteenth. And Louis the Fourteenth will not change uh, tremendously the building, but he will change the garden. So first of all, he decided, and it was not a good idea actually, to uh, take out the little garden on the pond. So you can see here on this tableau by Pierre, on this painting by Pierre Denis Martin that on the pond you, you don't have anymore the little garden that was built on the pond. But he um, he created the great Jardin à la Française, the French gardens uh, in Fontainebleau. It was it's one of the first um, um, the first creation of André Le Nôtre hein, in Fontainebleau in what is called today the Jardin de Diane, and then in the Grand Parterre. So he, he really um, created uh, this uh, this French gardens in Fontainebleau. He also created Water, um, water games in Fontainebleau. We have the Passant des Cascades. There was a kind of a, of a large uh, alley of uh, of, uh, of cascades uh, just in front of the of the canal. And he had a lot of fun in Fontainebleau. He went hunting. So you can see on this painting, he's in front of this Bassin des Cascades. You can see kind of a galley on the canal uh, in in the background. He also built this very charmful little pavilion on the pond. Louis Le Vaux built it, the Pavillon de l'Étang. And we know when we read the memoirs of Saint-Simon that in this little uh, pavilion, you can have like a, a late ending parties and dinner, dinner parties, uh, and you can only get there by boat. So it was a very charmful um, place. It was also um, renovated under the reign of Louis XV, then Napoleon I and Napoleon III. Uh, so it, it has been used um, at all time for, for like a private um, pavilion. And in the pond, carps were very important. And the carps of Fontainebleau are very important. So I wanted to, to talk about that uh, because we know that when um, Louis XIV established Marly, the Chateau de Marly, he wanted to have a basin for his carps and he had to take the carps in Fontainebleau to bring it in Marly. And when his favorite carp, La Dorée, the golden one, uh, died, uh, she, it was a carp from Fontainebleau, when she died, well, he was kind of, um, of uh, well, doing, a, he was kind of a widow of, uh, of his carp. And then we arrive to Louis the Fifteenth, the hunting queen, king. So in Fontainebleau, Louis the Fifteenth was really keen on going hunting, and he transformed a lot the uh, Chateau de Fontainebleau. He came very often uh, to Fontainebleau, and he transformed it um, tremendously. Uh, for example, you can see on the on the image on the right the Louis XV wing, wing, the Louis XV wing that was built uh, on the project of the architect Gabriel, and that replaced the Odysseus Gallery, la Galerie du Lys, the great gallery of 150, uh, 150 uh, meters uh, gallery decorated by Prima Show, where it was probably in a bad condition, so it was destroyed to create this new wing to have apartments to lodge a court that was even more important. He also built the what we call the Gros Pavillon that replaced the pavilion where the apartment of Gabriel Destré was. It's a very beautiful and, and uh, organized um, pavilion. And here you can see that's a quite interesting image. Here, the junction between the 16th century wing and the 18th century wing. And you see how in Fontainebleau, we try to make things look good together, but it's not always perfect. And you can see the, you can see the seeming, you can see the transitions, but still this, 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 there is always this will of keeping what was there before. Here is a very beautiful view of this uh, Gros Pavillon with the um, charmful uh, Pavillon de l'Etang. And for example, in the bedroom of the Duchesse d'Etang, we know that uh, Louis XV wanted to have a new uh, royal staircase. So he destroyed the chamber, so he took out the chimney, he took out the bed, but he decided to keep the stucco and painting decoration. So the architect basically had to take the stucco out, and then build the staircase, and they put back the stucco back in. This was a very complicated operation. So it shows how much important the past was for Louis XV. Louis XV also did new decor, decors, new decorations, and this one is one of the most beautiful, the Grand Cabinet, the Council Cabinet that was painted uh, and, uh, between uh, 1751 and 54 with um, this um, very beautiful camaille, alternatively blue and pink camaille, painted by Carl Van Loo, by Jean-Baptiste Marie-Pierre, representing allegories of virtues and the seasons. And it was the place where Louis XV was uniting his, his council. So he was surrounded by these figures of virtues, of courage, of justice. So 
so that it can give him good ideas to how, how to govern France. It's also in this Grand Cabinet that the niche, the, the houses for the dogs were kept in Fontainebleau. You had two very big niches of a one meter 20 high uh, where the, the dogs were, were kept. So dogs were also very important in Fontainebleau. The ceiling of the council cabinet that was done by François Boucher, and that recalls the Grand Cabinet of Francis I, uh, whose decor was draw, draw, drawn by Francesco Primaticcio. And then we arrive to uh, the, the end of the Ancien Regime with Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Well, Louis XVI did some bad things in Fontainebleau. First of all, he decided to double the wing of the gallery of Francis I, so it was not really a good idea, but uh, some of his decorators also did very beautiful things, such as uh, the Turkish boudoir of Marie Antoinette. It was refurnished uh, for uh, Josephine, the uh, empress, but uh, for Marie Antoinette, all the paneling that you can see with this little um, Oriental mood with a uh, um, with a uh, mo moresque girls with uh, with feathers on the head with little incense burners uh, with um, cr moon crescents and stars. This Oriental mood is uh, the, the the mood of the Turkish boudoir. It's a very beautiful place in um, in the Chateau uh, de Fontainebleau that could be accessed from the Oval Court and also by the little uh, staircase for the spread that was just on the side of the boudoir. And you also have the magnificent boudoir d'argent, the Queen's boudoir in the Grand Appartement uh, that was done uh, in 1786, just before the last uh, sojourn of the court in, um, in Fontainebleau for Marie Antoinette, where the, furnish, the furniture, you can see the magnificent um, bureau with uh, Mother of Pearl, uh, in, Mother of Pearl in lace um, for Marie Antoinette, the, 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 the furniture, the paneling, all, everything goes together with a beautiful ceiling by Berthelemy. It's the last. It's the last shade of, of the Ancien Regime. And there was also, I didn't show it, show it on, on this PowerPoint, but a bedroom that was uh, re remade, a bed was remade for Marie Antoinette, but well, she never slept in it because the revolution burst out. And then we arrived to Napoleon I, who decided to give a new life to Fontainebleau when he arrives to the power. So he's the one who destroyed the wing that was closing the, um, the royal court. And he installed this, uh, this golden rail uh, that you can see there with all the symbols of Napoleon. So I can show you quickly the throne room that, that was installed in what used to be the king's bedroom. Also the little emperor, uh, emperor the bedroom here. And then you arrive under the reign of Louis Philippe, and uh, the story goes on more quickly now. Uh, Louis Philippe, who was a great restorator of Fontainebleau, who re he renovated all the grand decor of the Renaissance, and he created this uh, salle à manger, this dining room, just under the salle de bal. And finally, we arrive to Napoleon III and Empress Eugenia. They had a really, really good time in Fontainebleau, and they installed here kind of bizarre things such as the Musée Chinois, the Chinese museums. Did you know that in Fontainebleau we have one of the most prestigious collection of uh, Chinese objects in the world, uh, one of the most important porcelains uh, of the Qiangxi period uh, are, are there. Uh, also Japanese lacquer, um, well, it's a very, very important collection that comes in part from the Sac du Palais d'été in 1860, but not only, we also have numerous gifts from uh, from Japanese emperors, very beautiful kimonos from the Japanese emperors, but also some uh, jewels and crowns from the emperor of Siam, uh, which, which, which is now, I think, uh, Cambodia. So it's a very beautiful collection. And of course, the jewel uh, of, uh, of the weekend's wing, the Imperial Theater, a very beautiful, tiny theater that was created in 1861 uh, for uh, Eugenie and Napoleon III. It was not used very many times. It has been restored uh, from uh, 2014 to 2019. And so it has just reopened and it's, it's really a pearl, a pearl of, of Fontainebleau. Of Fontainebleau's treasures. So, since you are the Alliance Francaise, I thought I had to say a few words about the American history of the Chateau de Fontainebleau. And it starts with Rockefeller. We owe a lot to Rockefeller because thanks to him, uh, we could uh, rebuild in the early uh, 20th century the great uh, Chimney Wing because there was a fire in 1856. And uh, thanks to uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, it was rebuilt between uh, 1920 and 20. 
for then the American art schools of Fontainebleau. It's kind of a conservatoire, a conservatoire of music and dance that was that was inaugurated in 1921 in Fontainebleau, and it was settled in the Louis XV wing. And we still have today each year concerts and uh, recital uh, from this uh, Ecole d'Art Américaine, which are very important. And then our projects, your hair. I wanted to talk about what we are now doing in Fontainebleau, uh, as you are the Alliance Française and you are like helping out French culture in the in the in US. I wanted to talk about uh, what we are trying to save today because times are not easy for heritage. So for example, the Golden Gate, I talked to you about this very important Renaissance space, the Golden Gate of Fontainebleau, not of San Francisco, but of Fontainebleau. Um, and you have this uh, this decoration of Primaticcio that has been damaged by by the time, also by uh, the, the restoration of the 19th century. And we now need to restore it, to give it back uh, to the public and to reopen this space. So uh, we have done uh, lots of studies to how to restore this space, the Primaticcio paintings, and also the stucco uh, decoration. We also have the Egyptian though, you remember the, the ideas, ideas of having parties in Sphinx decoration and Sphinx uh, and hieroglyphic um, uh, mysteries. Well, this door also has a problem of, uh, of, uh, of conservation. You can see that this Pluto is missing a leg and it's of course, it was not missing a leg at the beginning of the story. So we need to restore also this, um, this door and the uh, famous Chasse Royale of Jean-Baptiste Oudry, the, the most important ensemble of monumental paintings of this great um, French 18th century uh, painter. And we, are, we want to restore all the, um, all the paintings uh, to present it to the public in a show in 2000. 24. Well, you can, as you can see, uh, Fontainebleau uh, has kind of an American history. We have American friends of Fontainebleau. They, they support the Chateau de Fontainebleau and they, and they try to help us to, to share the beautifulness of Fontainebleau and to restore works of us. Uh, and uh, US-based donors uh, can, uh, can support our activities in a very tax-efficient way. So don't hesitate to, um, to check on the internet the American friends of Fontainebleau in the King Baudouin Foundation, and here you can see on the, on the right, Jeff Koons in Fontainebleau presenting his collection. I had a very good time with Jeff Koons, actually. It was extremely nice uh, for the Festival d'Histoire de l'Art in the Milice. So as you can see, there is a little something of America in Fontainebleau, and there is also something of Fontainebleau in Miami, I think. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to see you soon in the Chateau de Fontainebleau. So if you have questions now. Thank you so much, uh, Oriane, for that very uh, comprehensive uh, romp through 800 years of history, because you had a lot to cover there, no doubt about it. Uh, on the subject of our wonderful hotel in Miami, uh, we know where that got its name, but where did the chateau get its name, Fontainebleau? Well, I will, I will still need to know how the Miami Hotel, why is the Miami Hotel is called Fontainebleau? Why is that? You have to answer the question first. Well, it's the obvious resemblance between the hotel yeah. and the chateau. That's what I was telling myself. No, is there a reason why? Because I think there is like a Versailles wing in the Fontainebleau Hotel. So it's, so what's the story about that? Uh, I'll have to research that a little more. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I went into a little, uh, well, Fontainebleau, the name of Fontainebleau comes from the Fontaine Belle Eau, so the fountain with beautiful water. So this is the legend, the mythic origins of Fontainebleau in the, with this uh, fountain. Okay, well, that sounds good to me. Um, what, is it true that uh, Fontainebleau, you mentioned that it's one of the first chateaux to actually start having artistic collections. Um, how about, uh, and it's got, how many rooms are uh, in the chateau and how many rooms are actually open to the public? Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, we have uh, 1,700 rooms in the chateau, but you cannot visit all of them. But I, I can't tell you how many rooms uh, are, are opened uh, to, the, to the public. But, uh, well, the most beautiful can be seen. Okay. 
And is it, uh, is it accurate to say that the Fontainebleau was one of the first chateau, if not the first royal chateau, to have permanent uh, furnishings, as opposed to moving around from chateau to chateau? I don't know if we can really say that, because the moving around chateau, chateau to chateau was really something that you do in the Renaissance time period. So the, fa the fact of having like furniture in place really comes later. So I think it kind of in the same time for everyone. So I won't say we are the first on that topic. Okay. Uh, we had a question regarding the stag gallery that you mentioned, uh, which was created by Henri IV or under Henri mm -hmm. IV, is that correct? Yeah. So what, was it inspired by the gallery of maps uh, of the Vatican, which was uh, apparently created sh slightly before? It's possible. It's possible, though it's always difficult to, to talk about influence because you never know if the artist responsible for this or this decor or have seen the, the, the maps gallery of the Vatican before. But there is a trend in France of doing galleries with maps. There is this kind of a passion for cartography in the late 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century. And there, were, there was a project of doing a, um, a maps gallery like this in the Louvre. And on these maps, you could see Jerusalem, Paris, and Fontainebleau, which we are very important, and almost as important as Jerusalem and Paris. So there is also a common trend of doing cartographic decors in France. But there, there, there might be a link with the maps gallery. OK. Now, you covered, a, there are a remarkable number of different courtyards, wings, gates, you know, that it were built and rebuilt and expanded and replaced over the years. It's quite quite uh, challenging to keep track of it all. Uh, if we go on the website of uh, the Chateau de Fontainebleau, is there a good overall plan where we can see how they fit together? Yes, you have uh, in Fontainebleau in the Chateau, we have a, a, a maquette that helps you find your way around. But on, the, on the, the website, you can find some plans. I'm not sure that you have like the, the, the perfect comprehensive plans of all the courtyards well indicated, but you know, there's also kind of a pleasure of getting lost in Fontainebleau. <laughs> okay. I get lost every day. Uh -huh. um, you, you showed some wonderful photographs uh, of the Porte Doré, the Porte de Bat Baptisterie. Um, what was the primary entrance to the chateau uh, under the reign of Francois Premier? The Porte Doré, the, the Gilded Porte. Gate, the Porte Doré. So that was the front door was over there. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the cour d'honneur was the back yeah. door. At, at yeah, no, no, the, the cour d'honneur was not really an entrance actually, because you had another cour d'hôtel uh, on the other side of the, of the court. So it became a, really a court under the late, uh, um, late 16th century. There was an, an, a beautiful door. And then under the reign of Louis XIII with the, with the, the great horseshoe staircase, then it became Kind of the center of the of the of the life of the court. Okay, and you showed the port the uh, the baptism gate. Did that three, yes. Place the gold gate as an entrance when it was built. Yes, yes. Yeah. It, it it became a new. Well, it didn't replace, but then there were several big entrances, and this one was extremely important, and it has this name of baptistry gate because it's in the oval court that Louis the Thirteenth, well, the Dauphin Louis was baptized in 1606. And so it was in this space and he went under this door. So that this is why it's called the baptistry door. Okay, good to know. Um, you showed a, a wonderful drawing of the Chateau. I think it was around the time of Henry IV. Not sure, but there was one plan that uh, actually was yeah. more likely uh, a little later. Uh, was that... Uh, Du Cerceau, who did that? No, no, no. it's later than Du Cerceau. It's later than Du Cerceau. It's a map of the 16th century, of the 17th, of the early 17th century. Sorry. Okay. But Du Cerceau did uh, several views of uh, of Fontainebleau, and he's the one who said that uh, all the best that Francis I had was for Fontainebleau. Now you said there were 1,700 rooms in the chateau. So was it a little bit like Versailles, where not only did the king and his immediate family live there, but did the court live in yes. the chateau? The court lived there, but 
Well, there's always someone to, to, to ask a question about Versailles when we talk about Fontainebleau. Yes, the court lived there. That's why Louis XV wanted to enlarge um, the spaces in the chateau that were devoted to having apartments for the court. So the court lived there, but uh, the court uh, who wanted to be close to the king and that could not get apartments in the chateau, they will build hotel particulier in the city of Fontainebleau. And this is how the city of Fontainebleau grew because actually the parish was Avon, so the, the, the town where you have like the, the train station now and the city of Fontainebleau really, was really created by having people of the court having like residence secondaire, if I may say, uh, in Fontainebleau in the yeah. 16th, the 17th, the 18th, the 19th century. Ah, interesting. Um, what happened to the chateau during the revolution? Well, during the revolution, it was emptied. But it was not, uh, the, the chateau did not suffer from many destructions you know, during the revolution. It was, uh, there was no furniture, but uh, it was, um, was kind of preserved. But it was, of course, no, not occupied. So when the chateau is left empty, uh, there, is always, uh, there are always some um, damages. Okay. Can you recommend a particular book that would be a, a, a good reference book for the history of? Uh... Well, I would say that the, the, the best one is probably uh, the big book on the Chateau de Fontainebleau by the editor Swann. It's, it's the most um, all-encompassing book on Fontainebleau. But you know, Fontainebleau is, uh, cannot be comprehended it's probably in just one book. So I could recommend lots of little books on little subjects, but maybe the Swann book is the most, um, is the most comprehensive on the subject. S W A N, Swan. S W A N, yeah. Okay, well, good, good to know. Do you know if it's in English? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. It's a very beautiful book, though. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Oyan, for your excellent presentation. We've really thank learned a lot about it. You gave us a, a heck of a good start on getting lost uh, at uh, Fontainebleau the next time we're there. Uh, there's so many wonderful parts to discover uh, and we definitely look forward to visiting uh, Fontainebleau. One last question, How, what is the best way to get there from Paris? To, to get there from Paris, well it depends. If you have a car you can uh, take the route but I don't have a driving license so I can't tell you how to do it. But if you uh, come from uh, by train you can take a train in the Gare de Lyon it's a 40 minutes uh, ride through the forest of Fontainebleau. Well, not only the forest of Fontainebleau, but you can cross the forest of Fontainebleau with the train. And after uh, this, uh, this train ride, uh, you have a little bus that can bring you to the chateau, or you can walk through the park to arrive uh, in, the, in the Grand Jardin uh, of André Le Nôtre. And that's a very beautiful view when, when, uh, when the weather is nice. Okay. Well, so we well, are waiting for you. Well, uh, we look forward to coming. Um, so thank you so much once again, Oyan. Uh, let me just, before we say goodbye, I'd like to also thank uh, our co-host for the series, the Alliance Francaise um, Miami Metro, Alliance Francaise de Chicago. Uh, our partner is the Federation of Alliance Francaise, the French Heritage Society and Weiss in Paris. And of course, most of all, thank the people who attended today's lecture. We will be receiving uh, recordings of this lecture in case uh, you may have had to leave early or for those of you who were unable to register. And we uh, invite you to please tune in next Thursday, same time, same place for a tour of the historic Chateau de Beaumont with its curator, Guillaume Fonquenet. Uh, the Chateau de Guan was built not by Francois Premier, we we're gonna make a little bit of a change here uh, <coughs> by his comrade in arms, Anne de Montmorency, who was quite an exceptional man in his own right and had again, quite an exceptional wife who assisted him in the construction of this jewel. Of the, <coughs> the lecture will be in English as will all remaining uh, lectures in the Chateau series. So I would invite you all to please unmute yourselves now and to join me in giving Oyan Bofis a round of applause. Merci. Bravo, bravo, Oyan. Merci, merci, merci beaucoup. Merci. 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 Merci.
Merci. Merci, Russell. Merci. Merci. Merci.